One thing we thought we could improve over the number 160 and 165 release was the foam that we included in packaging. We cut that foam by hand, but wanted the look of custom cut foam. But that's prohibitive in small quantities and shipping is really expensive from overseas. We found some great videos online on milling foam from Winston Moy and John Grimsmo. You can check out those links in the description below. For the number 160 and 165, we used a foam called expanded polyethylene, which is a sort of plasticky foam with really large cells. It's not very appropriate for milling, so we decided to use something called cross-linked polyethylene this time. It's fairly rigid, smooth, and has very small pores, and it mills very cleanly compared to open-celled foams like expanded polyethylene. Based on Winston's results, we decided to buy an end mill from Daytron. It was designed specifically for milling foam, with a polished cutting edge, large chip channels, and a very low helix angle. Daytron tools also tend to be geared towards higher speeds, which is great for us since we're running a CNC router that operates at 8,000 to 24,000 RPM. We ended up buying a 6mm diameter tool with a 27mm flute length, a bit more than an inch, which worked well for us because our deepest foam pocket was just a bit shallower than that. Before our production foam came in, we did some tests on some sample foam that we were able to get our hands on testing speeds and feeds, as well as our milling strategy. We found that climb milling leaves extremely rough wall finishes and sort of shreds the foam, while conventional milling leaves very smooth walls but creates long strands of foam that can get sucked in and wrapped around the cutter. Both of these methods leave a good floor finish, so we chose to use climb for roughing and conventional for a lighter finishing pass. After some experimentation, we found that leaving 25 thou after the roughing pass allowed us to get great wall finishes on a finishing pass, while still being thin enough that the strands would break before they got long enough to wrap around the cutter. We used a 3D adaptive toolpath for roughing. During our testing, we found that about 17.6K RPM was a good sweet spot for us. This is about a four on our DeWalt 618 router speed dial. The foam leaves some buildup on the cutter over time, and more RPM generates more heat, which leads to more buildup. We're cutting at 230 inches per minute, which gives us about a four and a half thou feed per tooth. We're also using a fairly aggressive 75% optimal load for adaptive clearing. At first, we were helixing into the material, but it's foam. There's not much strain on the cutter, and plunging gave us the same result in much less time. Finally, we leave 25 thou radial stock to leave for our finishing pass. For that finishing pass, we use a 2D contour with the same settings, except that we switch from climb to conventional milling. Our foam came in large 4 by 6 foot sheets, which we had water jet cut down to the size we wanted them in. We milled a fairly simple locating fixture out of MDF, so that we could mill three pieces at a time, securing the foam with simple double-sided tape. We found that our double-sided tape was too strong. It would tear the foam when removed, so we used some 3M general purpose painter's tape to protect the foam and applied the double-sided tape to that. Once we knew where the foam was gonna be, we created a component pattern from the cam operations we created earlier and applied them to the other two pieces of foam. While we were actually milling, after a cycle finished, we'd remove the bit and toss it in an ultrasonic cleaner did a great job of removing any buildup so that our wall finishes didn't get worse over time. Honestly, we're not sure whether this buildup is an actual problem because we never let it get too bad, so you could experiment with it a bit if you didn't want to clean the tool so often. But the ultrasonic run was about three minutes, which is about the time it took us to vacuum up after a cycle and replace the milled foam with unmilled stock, so we didn't waste too much time here. There are a few things you might do differently next time. First, a stream of compressed air might prevent strands from getting caught around the bit, so we could do two-way adaptive milling to save some time. We tried two-way adaptive with smaller optimal load on the conventional cut, which sped things up by about 20%. However, in a cycle with three test pieces, we had to stop twice to remove strands that got caught around the cutter. So we decided to stick with climb milling for roughing so that we wouldn't have to worry about stepping away for a minute. Second, we could skip the 3D adaptive altogether and use a 3D pocketing operation. I honestly liked the pattern that adaptive milling left on the floor of the foam, but I don't think there's any particular reason that you couldn't just use pocket clearing here. Adaptive clearing is useful to make sure you don't put undue stress on the cutter when it digs into corners, but we're milling foam, not metal. So we might just pocket next time. And that's everything. All in all, it only took us about a day of milling time to finish the 66 operations necessary to mill foam for 22 kits. Now that we know more of what we're doing, we expect to take even less time in the future. Thanks for watching. We hope you found this helpful or at least interesting. We're really new to this, so if you have any suggestions or experience you'd like to share, please feel free to leave it in the comments.